time in people's busy work weeks to do things like this. Uh, we were just having this conversation a few minutes ago about whether for the executive community in Washington, if this could be like 8 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. and we could get, get more and more people. But I have to, while I'm willing to take any advice on all of those issues, the main thing that I want to just note here is that what we're trying to do here at the business school is to be a center of interesting conversations that are really about the ways in which business, public policy, politics, society, all work together in, in an interesting dialogue and really advance what the role of business in society is. And so I think that, you know, wherever we end up in the time of, 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 of these uh, types of moments, what we're calling now the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, I just want to thank all of you for coming out and being a part of this because that's the most important thing. Now, I, I, before I get uh, started into my comments about our, our speaker, I just want to note a couple of things. I want to specifically thank faculty and, and staff for coming out to these things because these are, you know, these are not only part and parcel of what we do at this school, but uh, they're also, you know, part of the story that we tell. Uh, I recognize a number of faces in the crowd, although I think, Ed, I don't want to call you out, but I think you've been at every Dean's Distinguished Lecture lecture talk that we've had over the last 18 months, and I want to thank you for that, and thank all of you uh, for just being excited about what it is uh, that we're trying to kick off as a conversation, because I want to make no mistake about this. This is an interesting moment for business and society, but it's also an interesting moment for business schools specifically, and we are working very hard to actually lead what, what Marat and I, and Marat, Sofiona and I call the revolution. Uh, maybe we're a little bold in talking about the revolution, but we actually think that it's a revolutionary moment to talk about what the role of business in society is and what role business schools can play in that moment. And so it's it's a, it's a great time and it's a great moment, and I thank all of you for coming out in an early morning uh, to talk about these issues. I understand that our speaker was actually up at, at 6 a.m. having a, an even earlier conversation uh, with a, a, a Washington fixture. Um, and so he's been at it for several hours already. Uh, but to my mind, there's, I'm not gonna spend much time introducing him because I actually wanna leave that to uh, our board of advisors member, Denise Brockman, in to talk about this. But I just wanna save her uh, a couple of, of points to note. Um, to me, it's the most exciting thing when we bring people in who really can bridge this gap of the discussion of the role of business in society uh, and of course, the role of Wall Street and the role of finance in society is important. Um, and we have before us today a, a prophet, a sage, a, a person uh, of, of the, the, the public sphere who talks about these issues and is listened to. Um, I, I just have to say for myself, I, I have noted his, his uh, as I've tried to get up and running and think about what my Twitter following is, I'm proud of the fact that I'm at 400 or something, whatever academics can muster, and, and he's at 35,000. <laughs> and the greatest thing about him on Twitter uh, is that he, he just told me this morning that he was he was blocked from my former colleague, Noria Albini, um, <laughs> which I, I have to say, like, Noria would even, never even deign to block me because he wouldn't, you know, even though I've spent many days in elevators with him, like, kind of riding up and down and being a part of his world, he would never even remember me. So the fact that he's, he's like days to block this man means something about uh, that he's part of a conversation that I'm not a part of. Um, but the main point is that this entire series and this entire school is about being a platform for a conversation. And so it just gives me great pleasure to have people who come in and help us with that conversation and start that conversation and and I think today, as, as Doug and I discussed it, uh, he's gonna spend some time talking, but he's gonna actually look for engagement uh, and uh, dialogue with you all. And so that's what we hope for. Now, I could not do these kinds of things that I do as a dean. And it's one of the most enjoyable and fun things as a dean is you kind of launch these things and have these, these, these moments, but really these things don't happen without the people who help you do the work. Um, and one of the greatest things that I've experienced as a dean is the wonderful board of advisors that I've inherited. 
Uh, it's just an amazing group of people. These people are so excited about where the future of the school is and where the vision uh, that we've all kind of constructed together is going. Uh, and one of my uh, uh, great friends and colleagues in this uh, has been an individual named Steve Mertinger, who has just been, you know, the, the perfect uh, kind of foot soldier that you would, I mean, Steve, every time I talk to him, he says, what do you need me to do? How can I help you? What are you, what can I help you do? Uh, and so one of the things he's done today is, is, is to bring his, uh, his friend Doug Katz to the, uh, to this series. And so I want to introduce Steve Mertinger as, as somebody who I just respect and admire and I'm, I'm thankful to be able to call a friend uh, and ask him to introduce I believe in this institution. Uh, I'm a 1976 graduate of this business school. My daughter is now a junior in the business school. And um, I've been fortunate in my career and with family and whatnot to have uh, gotten to know a gentleman by the name of Doug Cass. And in knowing Doug Cass as a, I know him more as a family man, uh, a leader, a true friend, and a gentleman that uh, is deeply committed to what he believes in. Uh, he's had a, a good amount of uh, success and good fortune in expressing what his views are on the financial world and the world at large uh, through both uh, written media, television, radio, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard him on CNBC, on Bloomberg, uh, maybe read, read him, uh, his columns, on the street.com, uh, but he's a very, very committed friend. So in knowing that he has spoken at Yale and at Harvard and he's gonna speak at Northwestern, uh, he's a member of the Board of Trustees and the head of the Investment Committee at Alfred University, I called on Doug and I said, I want you to do this for Blake. Blake is my daughter. Uh, he was uh, kind enough to say, tell me a little bit about GW and what's happening at the business school. Um, as you know, our uh, distinguished dean has uh, decided that we should become uh, a much more uh, highly recognized university or, or business school. And um, in doing so, a number of us on the board of advisors have bought, in, bought into what he uh, chooses to have accomplished over the next five to seven years. And one of those is to bring people like Doug Cass here to add a lot more credibility to the school and elevate its stature. So with that, most of you know he doesn't need any more introduction. I'll give you my good friend, Doug Cass. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's a pretty small group, so I really don't want to um, give a soliloquy. I want you to interrupt me if you want, if you have questions you don't understand what I'm saying, you un don't understand my metaphors. I'm gonna really wing it. Um, but I will tell you that, um, as I mentioned to Blake and Steve, um, when people ask me to um, discuss my forecast of the economy and the stock market, I'm reminded of a story of the University of Edinburgh Medical School, where the professor asked the class, what part of the human body expands seven times the size under stimulation? Um, a very attractive woman like Blake in the front row, Miss Carpenter, he said, Miss Carpenter, please stand up. You know the answer to the question. She turns beet red, so embarrassed. She says, I can't possibly answer the question. Mr. Kennedy, behind us, go, Puts his hand up, yes, Mr. Kenny, do you know the answer? He says, yes, of course I do. The pupil of the human eye expands seven times under the stimulation of light. He says, uh, ma'am, can you step up again? She says, yes. He says, I have three things to tell you. You haven't done your homework, you have a dirty mind, and you can live a life of unfulfilled expectations. <laughs> so if you, if you really think that I'm gonna tell you where the economy is going and the stock market is going, you too will live a life of unfulfilled expectations, but at least I work cheap, Doug. <laughs> so, I'm gonna talk for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what went wrong in 2011, what could go right in 2012, 
and um, I'm going to discuss some of my surprises for 2012. I do a surprise list. I've done it since 2003. Uh, I publish it on thestreet.com. There are a bunch of subscribers in the audience, and you can just go to thestreet.com and um, you know, a search cast surprises, and you can get all the all the stuff. And um, I would say that some of you that know me um, recognize that um, by nature I'm not an optimist. I'm one of those guys uh, that sees the glass half empty. I've been a short seller my whole life, but I think for 2012, um, I envision a stairway to heaven in the stock market and uh, in the economy. And of course, I'm referring to the great Led Zeppelin song, which a little trivia, it was nine minutes long. They could never make it into a single Stairway to Heaven. Um, so it was on the album in 1971. And it's widely considered one of the greatest rock songs of all time. Um, one of the chorus lines goes like this, um, written by Jimmy Page. Uh, and it's whispered that soon, if we all call the tune, then the piper will lead us to reason. And a day will dawn for those who stand long, and the forests will echo with laughter. So I consider this song's words uh, and its title, Stairway to Heaven, a, a metaphor for the likely course of the U.S. stock market this year, that it's higher, and it's going perhaps much higher. Um, if if you know Led Zeppelin, the song um, consists of several distinct sections, beginning with a quiet introduction on a finger-picked six-string guitar and four recorders in uh, almost a Renaissance music style. It gradually moves into a slow electric middle section, then a long guitar solo before the faster hard rock final section that ends with a short coda in the same style as the introduction. And Jimmy Page, the great rock and roller and lead singer of Led Zeppelin, explained, quote, going back to those studio days for me and John Paul Jones, the one thing you didn't do was speed up, because if you speed up, you wouldn't be seen again. Everything had to be right on the meter all the way through. And I really wanted to write something which did speed up and took the emotion and the adrenaline with it and would reach a sort of crescendo. And that was the idea of it. That's why it was a bit tricky to get together in stages, close quotes. So I anticipate the year 2012 to proceed much like the steady beat of Led Zeppelin's Stairway of Heaven, building up to a crescendo uh, by the third quarter of 2012. And there's a bunch of uh, factors, um, and I'll give you the, the bullet points why I'm optimistic. Firstly, all the domestic and U.S. concerns are well known. They're not likely to be discounted again. The market rarely discounts something twice. And importantly, will diminish in consequence as the year goes on. Secondly, the negatives, as I will discuss in terms of valuation of the stock market, are sufficiently discounted. Thirdly, the prospects for U.S. political regime change, although it's taken a turn for the worse for the Republicans in the last week or so, probably will embolden investors as the year unfolds. And finally, as we learned yesterday in the Federal Reserve meeting, interest rates will remain low while inflation stays quiescent. So just to summarize and utilizing three um, additional lines from three different Led Zeppelin songs, investors were dazed and confused in 2011, but the outlook for 2012 over the hills but not too far away, is likely to be turning into a whole lot of love by the second half. And of course, I'm referring to the song Whole Lot of Love in which Paige wrote, you've been yearning and baby, I've been burning. All them good times, baby, baby, I've been discerning. You never thought you would hear about Led Zeppelin in this conversation, I'm sure. So let's go back to 2011, 12 months ago, and think about how we, ent how we entered the year. I entered the year with a wide range of economic and stock market concerns. My worries included, but were not limited to, structural unemployment and mounting fiscal balances at the local, state, and federal level. Um, I wrote um, in an editorial in Barron's in June of 2011, 
call the threat of screwflation, which talks about the growing inequality and the um, 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 disadvantaged middle class in this country. I expected a foul mood, that kind of foul mood, to weigh on consumer and business confidence and on the economic outlook. As well, I envisioned a deepening recession in Europe. Uh, my outlook for the stock market as a consequent was negative, uh, and I thought stock valuations were vulnerable and would be exposed to the, some of these developing headwinds and others. Throughout most of the year, I suggested that the stock market would be unstable until volatility quieted down, until our political leaders favored compromise over division. Uh, the European leaders and central bankers, bankers adequately addressed a growing debt crisis until the domestic economic data improved, especially after the very sharp erosion in business and consumer confidence, which occurred in late summer in August after the debt um, negotiations in Washington broke down between the Republicans and the Democrats. By contrast, most observers entered last year, 12 months ago, with a far more optimistic economic expectation of a, a normal self-sustaining economic recovery. And with stock market forecasts that generally contemplated a 15 to 20 percent rise in the major indices. For 2011, um, domestic real GDP ended up only about 1.7 percent in the U.S. That's approximately half the growth rate that was uh, the general consensus expectation as the year started. Corporate profits rose by 16 percent, but most of the senior market averages were in negative ground for the year as price earnings ratios uh, valuations contracted. In contrast, uh, in January 2012, we entered the year um, with uh, a, a transformation. Those optimistic economic and market assumptions a year ago have turned far more subdued, reflecting more downbeat economic growth and investor expectations. Individuals uh, have taken another $100 billion out of domestic equity funds in 2011. Hedge funds are now at their lowest net long exposure since the generational low in March 2009. Most dominant investors, therefore, have de-risked and are out of the market. Uh, consensus rarely triumphs uh, in, in my business, in the stock market, and I see 2012 as another year in which the consensus is going to be proven wrong. Now, I fully recognize, especially as being almost an investment nihilist, um, that the world is imperfect. That, uh, but the blemishes that we know, the structural headwinds, are all ver very well known and arguably incorporated in the stock market today. More importantly, three of my four concerns, high volatility, a mounting European debt crisis, a weakening domestic economy, and the division between the Republicans and Democrat parties are moving all in the right direction. The fourth, our divided leadership incapable of compromise, might now be coming closer to resolution with a country that appears to be leading towards the Republican Party. And uh, I'm a Democrat, but uh, Republicans are considered to be market friendly. Um, I think that a close win, as I will describe in my surprises for Romney, is now uh, my baseline expectation, and such a political outcome, as I said, would be more market-friendly than it would occur with another four years of the current administration. I am especially more optimistic that the U.S. economy's growth trajectory will exceed expectations of only a couple of months ago, given the improvement in jobless claims, the better PMI, ISM surveys, strength in automobile sales, and even a slight improvement in certain regions of the market and the housing market. I think all the concerns that we had three or four months ago of a double-dip recession have, div have vanished, and I think the outlook for 2012 corporate profits is uh, improving over the last 60 or 90 days. 90 days. In terms of Europe, um, uh, uh, quantitative easing, similar to 08, 09, done domestically by Geithner and Paulson um, and Bernanke, um, has basically taken systemic risk off the table. 
uh, the political leaders and the central bankers are slowly addressing their sovereign debt problems. Uh, though tame and timid uh, in their approach at the outset, more shock and awe is now being employed, and more is likely on the way. So it's my view that the European affliction, which was almost fatal four months ago, is moving towards a condition that we can tolerate, although we still have to monitor it. Another market-friendly condition is that central bankers around the world have signaled increasingly accommodative monetary uh, policies. They're all loosening. They're all easing. So with inflation quiescent, uh, low short-term interest rates around the world are here as far as the eye can see. So we've got better economic growth in the U.S., the hope for stability in Europe, a meaningful, potentially a meaningful rotation out of bonds and into stocks. Um, it's interesting, if you look at stocks over the last 50 years, they've averaged about 15.5 times price-earnings ratios at a time in which, over the last five decades, the yield on the 10-year Treasury was about 6.7%. Today, we're at 13.5 times, and the yield on the 10-year U.S. note is 1.97% this year. Um, now, historically, U.S. stocks have been valued 17 to 18 times versus 13.5 now when interest rates, inflation, and inflationary expectations are around current levels. The final point I want to make about um, valuations is that risk premiums, now a risk premium is the earnings yield, which is the inverse of the PE, less a risk-free rate of return, let's say corporate bond yields, um, are now elevated and back to the levels last seen in 1974. Um, as basically the European debt issue and some domestic concerns have accentuated um, a flight to safety. Uh, it's important to know that that last spike in risk premiums back in 1974 was followed by an S&P return in 1975 of 35% and in 1976 of 19%. So these low valuations provide the investor with a margin of safety. I also think that, um, that conditions have evolved over the near and intermediate term that have conspired to make domestic stocks um, the favored risk asset in the world. I like to say that the US stock market and the economy um, is the best house in a very bad financial neighborhood. So let me give you 10 reasons before I get into my surprises why I think we're going to see this rotation of investments out of non-domestic investments into our country, which we haven't seen, by the way, in a long period of time. This is known as the lost decade, uh, 19, nine, uh, 2000 to 2010. In fact, the S&P today is at the same level it was in December of 1998. First of all, U.S. relative and absolute economic growth is superior to global growth. Uh, the U.S. economy, though sluggish relative to history, relative to past expansions, is superior to most of the world's economies, with the exception, of course, of some emerging markets like India and China. In terms of diversity of end markets, quality of global franchises, management expertise, operating execution, and financial foundations, we are superior. Two, our banks are well capitalized. They're liquid and they're deposit funded. Our banking industry's health, which is basically the foundation of all credit and economic growth, is far better off than the rest of the world in terms of capital and liquidity. Our largest fin financial institutions raised tens of billions of dollars in 08 and 09 a full three and a half years ahead of the rest of the world. As an example, Eurozone banks continue to delay the inevitability of necessary capital raises. And it's very important to recognize that our domestic banking system is deposit funded. European banking system is wholesale funded. So when you have a wholesale funded banking industry, confidence is very important. You lose confidence, you lose your funding. Three, U.S. corporations boast 
strong balance sheets, very healthy margins and profits. Our corporations are better positioned than the rest of the world. Though through aggressive cost cutting, productivity gains, external acquisitions, internal capital expenditures, the absence of reliance on debt markets, most have opportunistically rolled their debt into low cost debt. U.S. Uh, corporations are rock solid operationally and financially. Even throughout the 08, 09 recession, most solidified the global franchises that serve increasingly diverse end markets and geographies. Fourth, the U.S. consumer is more liquid, more stable than any consumer in the world. We've had an aggressive Fed. They've had a zero interest rate policy since 08. It's resulted in an American consumer that has reliquified more than individuals that live in most other areas of the world. Debt service, household debt is down dramatically relative to income. Five, the U.S. is politically stable. After watching regime after regime fall in Europe in recent weeks, and given the instability of rulers throughout the Middle East, it should be clear that the U.S. is more secure politically <laughs> and from a defense standpoint than most other regions of the world. Our democracy, despite all of its inadequacies, has resulted in civil discourse, relatively balanced legislation, smooth regime changes, and law that has contributed to social stability and a sense of overall order. Six, the U.S. has a solid and transparent corporate reporting system. Um, this is something you're familiar with, Doug, having been in China a lot. Uh, our regulatory and reporting standards are among the strongest in the world. Um, compare, for example, the very opaque and less than transparent um, um, reporting system, regulatory oversight in China versus the U.S. It's beyond compare. Um, seven, the U.S. is rich in resources. Eight, the U.S. has a functioning and forward-looking central bank that is aggressive in policy when necessary and capable of acting during crisis. Nine, the U.S. dollar is still the world's reserve currency that is far more stable than the euro and most other currencies around the world. And finally, the U.S. is a magnet for uh, immigrants that want a better way of life. This and other factors have contributed to a better demographic profile of our country that has led to consistent population growth and household formations. Uh, demographic trends in the U.S. are particularly more favorable for growth than those uh, population trends in the Far East. So to summarize, um, I think that 2012 is going to be a surprisingly good year at a time when most most pundits are, are, are subdued and, and downbeat. I, um, I expect that domestic uh, economic and profit growth will surprise to the upside. And I am of the view that market valuations, which declined 15 or 17 percent, PE ratios in 2011, will probably expand by a like amount this year. So if Europe settles down, if the flight to, quality, uh, flight to safety of 2010 to 2011 should become a thing of the past this year, and fixed income instruments could probably take the brunt of the damage in a potentially large reallocation away from bonds and into U.S. stocks. Um, as I said, I have a balanced and objective reflection of the economic and the political imperfections that exist in our country today, and that certainly constrain valuations um, um, the reason valuations are low is, is a recognition of uh, relatively imprudent domestic policies that have led to our country's fiscal imbalances, but I think this is slowly changing. So I am um, increasing op optimistic. Let me, um, any questions about the first section before I get to surprises? Let's, let's, let's separate this and I'll go into the surprises because it's more fun to have an exchange of ideas. Yes, sir. Um, I believe that that would be very negative for the stock market. Yeah, and as, I, as I'll discuss on my surprises, I'll explain to you why I think you're wrong. But, you know, things can change. They change dramatically. And by the way, they've changed, you know, one of my concerns short term is uh, the um, uh, 
tremendous popularity, renewed popularity of Gingrich. Uh, and that I thought that um, this polemic between him and Romney um, would accrue to the benefit of the current administration. And if you look at the polls in Florida, now you look at the Intrade and the Rasmussen polls, which came out in the last two days, uh, uh, Gingrich has lost a huge amount and uh, is now uh, the underdog of Florida, whereas he was 14 or 15 points ahead in the polls. Uh, and he's in trade, I think Romney's 80% now to win the Republican presidency. Uh, but I'll go into that in my surprises. I'd be interested to know why you think he's going to win. But I'm a, de yeah. Oh, okay. I'm a Democrat too, but I don't think he's going to win. I hope he does, but I'm very disappointed in Obama. Um, I'm to the left of Obama, by the way, but um, I think he's failed in a lot of ways. Sir? I'm a list maker, and uh, I missed your number seven point. Um, well, I was making it up while I was talking, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might have said that the U.S. is rich in resources. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we have. Um, if, if, if you give me your card or you want to Google my Barron's piece, it's called the, the, the Threat of Screwflation. And I actually began to talk about this in 2009 in Barron's, and I did an editorial. policy that, that disfavors manufacturing in the last couple decades and favored financial innovation. And it hit us in the ass with derivatives, you know, those financial weapons of mass destruction in 08 and 09. And I think we're going to slowly move back because people realize how wrong it is, in part because of this populist movement. But we have basically the biggest headwind we face is the structural unemployment problem, and that's part of it, manufacturing. And there are several factors behind it. Technical ob, um, innovation has displaced a lot of jobs. We have globalization, which displaced a lot of jobs. The housing decline, and, and with people ha being less mobile, in other words, you live in Orange County, your house is $150,000 dollars underwater vis-a-vis -vis your mortgage, you get a job offer in Denver, you can't take the job offer. Um, education, we have a mismatch between um, talent and need, especially in manufacturing and engineering. So all this will be addressed. You see the pendulum swinging, um, uh, and depending upon where our currency goes, one could make the case that um, um, goods will be increasingly produced in this country, but this is, these, these are long-term trends, as you know probably better than I. Um, yes, any one more question before? Uh, uh, I'll take these first. Yes, Doug. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm sorry that it's going to be two questions, but I really want to hear five questions. questions. Um, this one actually uh, latches on to that question, but um, I think it's wonderful to think that you're optimistic about these issues, but the things that you just noted are 30 and 40 year problems that relate to the evisceration of vocational education in this country. They relate to a complete lack of understanding about what it takes to build and destroy a manufacturing sector in this country. And so like the mistaken idea, the mistaken understanding is that China's stealing our jobs because Let me just say that 
that my expectations for growth in the economy and corporate profits incorporates that headwind and the reality that you just mentioned. Okay. These are multi-decade issues that don't get resolved overnight, and especially we have a political system where we don't have term limits, where people, where, where our politicians and the electorate are impatient. They want short-term solutions to intermediate and long-term problems. So I, I, this I, is going to be with us for a long time. These are the two time. questions I want to ask you because when people make prognostications about the economy, and I, again, I love to hear a half glass full guy be bullish. I'm maybe even flat or half glass empty guy. I'm maybe even half glass empty more than you are because I just I can't see it. But there's an interesting thing that always happens when people key off of the stock market. So if you're looking at corporate profits and life is good, right? So like of course that relates to corporate profits as they're conceived of in the GNP model, right? right. Pre nineteen ninety one. Like it, right. if you look at how corporate profits work in terms of overseas manufacturing and all that, it looks great. Intel's making tons of money, right? right? But we don't have the right laws that allow them to compatriate profits. <coughs> so like, I just, you know, we live in a GDP world, right? Our GDP Look, world is- You're talking my book. Oh, so, but, but the I stock market- I like how you can be bullish Because, like, because let's, let's divide it into two things, the economy forecast and the stock market forecast. Stock market has the stock market is about discounting problems that we know. The economy is about the reality that you just presented. We still face, and that's why the Fed said what they said yesterday, that they're going to keep interest rates basically as low, as low as possible, as long as the eyes can see, probably into 2014, maybe 2015, because that's recognition of the headwinds in the slow growth environment. That slow growth environment that I suggested is still going to be less than the secular historic growth rate, less than prior expansions because of the problems that you mentioned and others like our fiscal balances, imbalances which have to be addressed and the austerity associated with that is growth deflating as well. So there are many, many issues. Trust me. Stephen will tell you. I've been on CNBC for 10 years talking about this. So I expect... No. Yeah. It's different. I'm very bearish on the U.S. economy. So we're in a period of a, a secular period of extended, disappointing growth, which will, look, we have 2% we have population growth, 2% productivity growth in this country, 1% population growth. That means you need 3% growth, real growth, to budge the employment rate, and we're not going to get it. The long-term growth rate of the economy is about 3, and a half, 3 to 3.5% domestically real economic growth and we're gonna fall short of that. So I'm in recognition that all is not great, but what has happened, as you're very well aware of and everyone else knows here, that corporations, through cutting costs and hurting the labor force, and this has created one of the factors that contributes for the, st the structural impairment, disequilibrium in the, in the workplace, is that uh, we're not, corporations learned how to deal with low growth. For example, we had humongous earnings growth last year, close to 20%, yet real GDP growth was one, under 1.5%. One so corporations have learned to deal with less people, to make the, work, the worker class more productive, and utilize temporary employees as a permanent factor in the workplace. Very important in a lot of points. So we're going to have this odd odd situation where, um, and the, maybe this is why I'm a Democrat, where, where, where the middle class is going to continue to be a victimized by screwflation. I call that a distant cousin to stagflation. Screwflation meaning that the middle class, real disposable income has made no progress in the last 10 years, while the necessities, the cost of necessities of life have gone up, so their real disposable income has been pressured. And the, the worker force faces, you know, a, 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 a unemployment and underemployed rate of 16.5%. That's the reality. While corporate profits in the second quarter will be at all-time record. So there is this disconnect, and this disconnect is what I've been talking about on TV for four years. And if it continues, 
And I said this on TV, and I remember Larry Kudlow laughing at me in 08, 09. I said, we're going to have riots on the street. And as I said previously, we had the Arab Spring. We have Occupy Wall Street. We had riots in Portland, et cetera. People are flailing around because they're so disconnected with the economy, which is the corporate profit economy, which is not their reality. So this is the big problem. So we have to, I'm not a politician. You know, I have to deal with the markets. And I have to say, what's discounted based upon current, how, how are we discounting future profits? Corporations have learned to live. And they may be penalized if the current administration continues for the next four years in an attempt to move that disproportionate role that the corporations have on national income back to the people. And that's what's happening. And you saw it in the Tea Party. It's not just the 08 Democratic tsunami, which brought Obama and the Democratic Congress. People are flailing around. It's on the other side of the pew as well. They don't know what to do. want to compare to what's happening in Europe, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain. No, I want to compare uh, it to China. Oh, that's your, is your advantage, because you know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so you go on. Well, I, 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 actually, I could respond to that, but we'll, we'll wait for that. Um, so I do the surprise list. Um, and uh, I, I've done it since 03. And my basic objective is to create this list of 10 to 15 um, probable improbables upon which an investor can make a bet, um, a small bet, on an outsized probability occurrence that actually has a greater likelihood to occur than people expect. And that's how you differentiate yourself as an investment manager. Um, Woody Allen's quote I love, he says, I'm astounded by people who want to know the universe when it's hard enough to find your way around Chinatown. So there are basically, in, in preparing this list over the last eight or nine years, there are five core lessons I've learned that form the uh, foundation of this annual surprise list. Firstly, how wrong conventional wisdom can consistently be. Secondly, that uncertainty will persist. Thirdly, to always expect the unexpected. Fourth, that the occurrence of uh, black swans are occurring with greater frequency. And five, with rapidly changing conditions, investors can't change the direction of the wind, but we can adjust our sales and our portfolios in attempt to reach our destination of good investment returns. Um, the real purpose, as I said, of this endeavor is a practical one. That is to consider positioning an investment portfolio in accordance with some outlier events with the potential for large payoffs on relatively small wages for investments. Um, if you look back since the mid-1990s, the quality of Wall Street research has deteriorated in quantity and quality uh, due to competition for human capital at hedge funds, brokerage industry consolidation, and naturally former um, New York Attorney General Elliot Spitzer's initiated reforms on Wall Street, and remains more than, than ever uh, a maintenance-oriented, conventional, and groupthink, I actually call it group stink, as I prefer to call it, um, mainstream and consensus expectations um, are just that. And in most cases, they are, as I said, Doug, deeply embedded in, ex deeply embedded in expectations and current stock prices. Uh, nothing is uh, more obstinate than a fashionable consensus 
And this annual exercise that I do recognizes that over the course of time, conventional wisdom is often wrong. I think as a, as a society and as investors, we are consistently bamboozled by appearance and consensus. Too often we are played as suckers as we accept the trend, momentum, and they're superficial as a certain truth without a shred of criticism. Uh, just look at those who brought, in, brought into the success of Enron, um, who thought that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, think about the heroic home run production of uh, steroid-laced Major League Baseball players like Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. Think about the financial supermarket concept at once was uh, the largest money center bank, Citigroup. Think about the uninterrupted growth of our government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, think about the new paradigm in housing in the early 2000s in which we we're never going to have a down year of home prices. Um, think about Back to Spitzer, the uncompromising principles of former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. Think about the morality of some of our politicians, John Edwards, uh, John Ensign, Larry Craig. Uh, think about the consistency of Bernie Madoff's investment returns and those of uh, other hucksters. And uh, think about the clean cut image of Tiger Woods. Um, Abba Iban, the Israeli foreign minister from 1966 to 1974 said, quote, consensus is what many people say in chorus, but do not believe as individuals, close quotes. Um, so when I look at my, um, my surprises for 2011, basically what I do is I tack some of the uh, closely grouped and nearly universal optimistic consensus expectations on the part of uh, money managers, um, CNB common, CNBC commentators, strategists, members of the media, the fourth estate. Um, I think when you look at, at history, there was no better example of misplaced optimism than the period leading up to the uh, Great Recession of 2008 and 09, providing a vivid reminder of a poor forecasting ability and investment risks associated with the crowd's baseline expectations and the value of surprise that, that deviates from the consensus. So uh, I'm not going to go back to why I was what I got right. The most important thing that you get right is where the market's going. And I made this amazing, my first surprise last year was the stock market, the S&P index, would close at um, the exact price, I think it was 1257, that it ended the prior year. And the most remarkable thing occurred. The S&P closed at 1257.60. And I was told that the odds of that were 3.3 trillion to one. Um, so with that in mind, um, I would say that since 07, I've had um, uh, my, my contrarian and variant surprise lists were almost uh, always downbeat relative to consensus. I had almost adopted a Kafka-esque sense of hopelessness um, and an almost Woody Allen-esque sense of foreboding. Uh, uh, Joe Kernan, my friend who I do Squawk Box with, said that uh, it was like I was giving a traffic report from the perspective of chronicling the automobile accidents and crack-ups of on I-95. But my surprises this year present a very fundamental uh, turn towards optimism and a marked departure from the past. So I have a more, I have a new, a brighter, a more positive narrative, and that's in essence the common thread of my surprise list. So my first surprise of the 15 is that the U.S. stock market approaches its all-time high this year. Uh, the beginning of the new year will bring a slightly better market, a range bound into uh, early second quarter, but a confluence of events, which I'll discuss briefly, allows the S&P to eclipse the high 
in 2000 of 1527. It's around 1320 now um, during the second half of the year. And this occurs with a powerful rotation out of bonds and into stocks and provides the, that basically is providing the fuel to an upside uh, breakout. Um, secondly, I believe that the growth in the U.S. economy will reaccelerate as the year progresses, uh, that the economy will muddle through in the early part of the year, but business, investor, and consumer confidence will surge in the fall when GDP accelerates to over 3% in the second half. Unemployment falls slightly more than consensus, but it's still at levels that are, are not acceptable. Uh, but the um, slack in the labor markets continues to constrain wage growth, uh, which is good for corporate profit margins. I believe that domestic automobile sales um, will be a highlight in 2012, well above expectations, benefiting from the pent up and unleashed demand from an aging fleet on the road. The average car in the US is now at an all time record 10.8 years old. As I said, corporations' top line growth will be better than expected. Wage increases will be contained. Operating margins will rise modestly as sales growth lifts productivity and utilization rates. Operating leverages to the upside of profits in the S&P will exceed $105 a share. I think a noteworthy surprise important to a lot of the older people here whose principal asset is their house is that the residential real estate markets in the U.S. will su show surprising strength. No one's really focused on what's going on in the housing market today. It's becoming increasingly bifur bifurcated. It's a market of haves and have-nots. The haves are areas of the country, like from Washington to Boston, that are unencumbered by the large uh, shadow inventory of unsold homes because of foreclosures. Um, I think that the New York City market um, is going to be um, especially vibrant and almost by the end of the year pick up again a speculative tone. Florida, the only area of the country that has had large supply imbalances since 2007, I believe will experience a meaningful recovery which will be led by a uh, surprisingly strong Miami market which as Steve will tell you is already starting to occur. The third surprise I have is the most controversial and people laugh at this one. And that is that former presidents Bill Clinton and George Bush will form a bipartisan coalition that persuades both parties to unite in addressing our fiscal imbalances. The Clinton-Bush initiative, also known as, I call it, Simpson Bowls on steroids, gains overwhelming popular support and despite st strenuous initial opposition, forces both the Democrats and Republicans months before the November elections to move towards a grand compromise on fiscal discipline and pro-growth fiscal policy. Interest rates remain subdued, growth prospects become elevated, and we have this feel-good atmosphere that begins to permeate our economy in a return of cap uh, confidence uh, and in our capital markets engendered by this initiative. Getting back to the fourth issue, surprise four, despite the grand compromise, the Republican presidential ticket gains steam as the year progresses, and Romney is elected the 45th President of the United States. The U.S. moved to the left politically in the Democratic tsunami in 08, to the right politically uh, as the Republican Party gained control of Congress in 2010, and 2012 is going to be the tiebreaker. The result of the tiebreaker, I believe, will be a Mitt Romney, Marco Rubio, my senator in Florida, and they will squeak by Biden and uh, Barack Obama. There's a wonderful interactive map that the New York Times provides. You just do a Google search. You can hit each state, turn it red, turn it blue. Uh, if you look at the five battleground states, Florida, Indiana, Missouri, North Carolina, and Ohio, um, they all went Democrat. Uh, the margin the difference was less than one and a half percent in all the states. Uh, I believe that they'll all go Republican this year. If you assume that the Romney-Rubio ticket wins New Hampshire and Virginia, um, which Obama won in 08 by less than six percent though, 
the Republicans will prevail with 270 electoral votes versus 268 for Obama in one of the closest elections of all time. Um, surprise number five, a sloppy start in arresting the European debt crisis, which we see in Greece already, leads to a more forceful and successful policy. The EU remains intact after a brief scare in early 2012, which we're seeing now, caused by Greece's disaffection, countrywide riots, um, their disaffection with the imposed austerity measures. The Eurozone experienced only a mild recession as the ECB introduces large-scale quantitative easing measures that exceed those introduced by the Fed in 08 and 09. Surprise six, the Fed ties monetary policy to the labor market, which they almost did yesterday in the release, uh, in order to encourage corporations to invest, to build up business and consumer confidence. The Fed changes its mandate and promises not, not to mo uh, tighten monetary policy until the unemployment rate goes below six and a half percent. Surprise seven, Sears Holding declares bankruptcy. I'm not going to go into that because fewer p people are interested in this unless you're long or short Sears stock. Um, surprise eight, cyber war intensifies. Our country's State Department defenses are hacked into and compromised by unknown assailants based outside of the U.S. Our armed forces are placed on DEFCOM 3 alert. Surprise nine, financial stocks after five years of underperformance, rebound dramatically and outperform the markets. Loan demand will recover. We'll see multiple takeovers in financial intermediaries. And I expect people are not focusing on this at all, but domestic banks will enjoy huge market share gains at the expense of European banks. Profit expectations are low. The industry has cut costs for three years. So there'll be revenue upsize from the improvement in the capital markets, a pronounced M&A activity, and better loan demand, and they'll have better than expected profits. Surprise 10, despite the advance in the US, U.S. stock market, the high-octane stocks, the you know stocks that go up 10 or $15 a day or down or $15 a day, will underperform the more mundane dividend-paying stocks, with the exception of one company, Apple, um, which, as most of you know, uh, reported extraordinary earnings uh, yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, Apple shares price rise above 550, uh, based upon a continued above consensus volume growth in the iPhone and the iPad. Uh, profit forecasts are lifted to almost $50 a share. And in the second quarter of this year, Apple pays a $20 extraordinary dividend, introduces a regular dividend, and splits the shares 10 for 1. Surprise 11, mutual fund inflows return in force after um, individual investors have taken out $450 billion from domestic equity funds since 2007 and put in almost $900 billion in fixed income funds, which are earning zero or next to zero. And I believe that's going to change. We're going to see number 12, surprise merger activity, especially in the financial area. Surprise 13, the exchange traded fund bubble will explode. There are 1,400 ETFs. I think we're going to see numerous ETFs which fail to track their underlying and they're forced to close. And I think we're going to see several flash crashes in large ETFs, which will result in huge litigation. Surprise 14, China has a soft landing despite the current indigestion in the property market. And, but India has a hard landing. India becomes the emerging market concern, not China. With, industry, uh, with India's trade not a driver to GDP growth, its currency in free fall, pressure to keep rates high by its central bank, and signs of a contraction most recently in November in industrial output, India's GDP fails to meet mid-single-digit level expectations. And my final surprise, 15, is that Israel attacks Iran. The greatest headwind to the world's equity markets, in my view, is geopolitical, not economic. And Israel, I believe, will attack for a variety of reasons, Iran in the spring. But at the outset, the U.S. will stay out of the conflict. Iran will close the Straits of Hermutes, and oil prices will spike to $150 a barrel. So let me throw it up to questions with those surprises in mind. Yes, Steve. Okay. First of all, I have to commend you for pointing this out. Uh, that's a response in June of 2020. But there were 15 things you mentioned, Joe. Back, but one that you're currently vacillating on, but not maybe you're 
Jerusalem? The one thing um, is that the potential exists. I, I, for, for the market to go to the levels that I expect, everything has, there has to be a confluence of events which are all positive, better economic growth, a good housing market, um, 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 some resolution or stabilization of the European debt crisis and the, the sovereign debt contagion. My biggest concern, as I expressed Monday, as you know, in a column, is if the Republicans shoot them, if, if they basically grab defeat out of the jaws of victory. I think that Obama is very exposed. The market wants a Republican president. Um, and if we don't get that, um, I'm afraid it will have an adverse uh, consequence on, on the markets, though not necessarily on the economy. So if I had to pull back one thing, it's that. And it's a really important thing. We have to watch. As I said, Gingrich has lost a lot of ground in the, in, in, even in the last two or three days. I suspect Romney will prevail easily. Uh, but this thing's extending itself out longer than I expected. Yes, sir. Doug. Doug. Oh, I, I said that we're going to have uh, that, that my basic surprise was that the, the consensus view that home prices uh, never decline uh, is going to prove to be fatal that we'll get that we will end up in a near depression condition because of that coupled with financial inno innovation uh, financial derivatives which have permeated the financial intermediaries the banks financial companies the insurance po property and casualty life insurance company and their investment portfolios and that it will take down the world's financial system, stated simply. And I was right on. And um, I felt several major money center banks um, uh, would be bankrupt. And they would have been were it not for the Fed. Right. One of my big surprises last year was, and I said that it was not on the radar, radar screen in December in, of uh, 10, 2010, when I wrote my surprises, for two, um, my surprises for 2011, was by the end of the year, by the fourth quarter, two months ago, that the, uh, Europe would be in a recession, which no one was thinking about at the time. We all know the problem now. Um, they face um, similar problems that faced our domestic economy in 08 or 09. Everyone knows the structural problems of the EU with 17 countries, that it's far easier to affect change in the U.S. versus getting the cooperation in the EU, in the Eurozone. Uh, and I think they're going to throw massive money at the problem. And um, Europe is screwed for a long, long period of time. Um, but it's manageable if done properly. I mean, Greece, for all the media coverage, you know, has 350, 300 billion dollars of of debt. It's it's not it's not the U.S. It's not Spain. The problems are Spain and Italy. Right. Greece is Greece is going to is a de facto default. We all know that. You know, they're going to write off somewhere between 65 and 80 percent, or 70 and 80 percent of their debt. And they'll still have, G, you know, a debt as a percentage of GDP in excess of 100 percent. So um, we're going to have long periods of austerity. We're going to have um, uh, social and civil problems in Spain and Italy stemming from this austerity. And we're going to have to deal. It's not the end of the world. And I recognize that no country is an island. No economy is an island. But in the end result, that's one of the reasons why I favor, and I see this rotation out of non-domestic investments into U.S. investments. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. What's your vision for the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? 
Um, oh, I also said, um, who asked me the question about last year's, about 07 surprises? Yeah, I said Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would go bankrupt, which was a real contrary view. Um, with the Republican administration or a Democratic administration, that's, I think that they'll probably be broken up into parts, into three or four parts, each of them. And um, I think there's a chance, if Obama wins, that some of the banks will be broken up. Yeah. It was interesting. I thought the State of the, I thought of the State of the Union team moved to the center. Although, when I watch MSNBC or listen to Bernie Sanders afterwards, who was very critical of it, um, but I suspect Obama, if elected, will move back in the direction that he started in 08. Um, yes, sir. It is a dismal science, they say. Um, it creates an inherently unstable foundation, which you have to monitor. And, um, you know, I saw it outside the hotel this morning, yes, Steve. You know, we, I, when I walked to meet you at BLT last night, I passed the Occupy Washington, or w what's it called? Occupy Washington, Occupy Wall Street. I think we're going to see a lot more of it because people are screwed. As I said, uh, screwflation is a, a very powerful force. Corporations have gained a disproportionate amount of the national income. And... W it's going to be reversed even with if Romney wins to some degree. If the current administration stays in, it will happen to a greater degree. It's, a, you know, it's one of those headwinds that creates lower secular growth vis-a-vis -vis past expansions. But you know, in my business, it's a question of what's been factored in. We know growth is going to be slow. We know Infl uh, uh, unemployment will be stubborn in terms of going down. Yes. yes. What do you run the risk of looking at these economic hiccups and misread the fact that it's the economy that caused this rather than just general incompetence? Uh, look at the same wiles that the Americans see today. I mean, you look at the Lehman Brothers, the Bear Stearns. The one common thread there was simple to look at the derivatives and kind of as the cause and effect, but if you look a little deeper, there's general incompetence. There's the but isn't, isn't that, the US bank, but the isn't, aren't they part and parcel of each other? These are the people that, that implemented, implemented. Um, but you're trying to read that. And you're trying to bubble yeah, but we, yeah, with all due respect, we've never seen anything like the 08, 09. I call it the great decession. It's a combination of depression and recession. Listen. But, our institutions were, were out of business. Bank of America was a city bank, was, would have failed. GM failed. If you own city stock, you own everything. Look at that management. Oh, by the way, As so I had breakfast with, have, so, so by the way, I had breakfast with Ralph Nader this morning. And I worked, when I went to Wharton, I wrote a book with Ralph Nader called City Bank. So, so you, I'm very familiar, so by the way, and, 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 what we talked about in that book, actually, which was published in 74, was about the importance of um, creating a curtain between lending and uh, the trust operation, among other things, like you know, taking money from the poorer communities and lending to Boeing, stuff like that, you know, typical Nader stuff. But all these problems could have been foreseen. And but, the, but all I'm saying to you is that you sort of, it sounds like you're sort of dismissing dis, the importance of how, how the pendulum shifted uh, toward, you know, 
every cycle, every cycle to me ends the same way and it all has to do with credit. Think about it. When credit gets easy, when credit is available to everyone, in the last cycle in low and no document residential mortgages, and when there's a new asset class, of, because of the aforementioned issues, there's a new buyer in the asset class. Think back to the 90s, which, what created the tech bubble. You had all these day traders that didn't even know what they owned. Um, they were leveraging the money 10 to 20 to 1 at, the, at those boil, boiler room, you know, the day trading firms. Um, the margin was very cheap, you know, it was 2, 3 percent. And you had this new asset class. What happened in the last cycle? Well, mortgage debt was readily available for virtually zero, you know, a five decade low in mortgage rates. And you had a new asset, you had a new buyer of the asset class, a speculator who never had an intention of moving in the house, which never happened in the history. So these are always the preconditions to a speculative bubble, credit and debt. And we're going to have it again. But it went to such a degree that in the process, as you know, Wall Street turned into this heads I win, tails I win uh, compensation where the amount of money that you could make was so amazing in the hedge fund business or in the investment banks that they would pr package these securitized products, sell and sell and sell. You had a Federal Reserve which had zero, basically had rates too low for too long, which forced people out on the risk curve, something that Bernanke is doing now, which I think is wrong, forced people to buy other risk assets because they had to get yield. And how did they get the yield? Wall Street packaged this product, a high-yielding product, which, um, which, was, you know, which was a myth and which imploded on everyone. So it was a combination of a normal cyclical downturn, which was steroid-driven by debt and greed. And that's, that's how we ended up where we are. But what happens, what I think will happen, getting back to one of the problems we have, why I don't like this quantitative easing and what, what Bernanke said yesterday, is um, the problem is not that rates are too low at all. The problem is banks aren't lending and they're faced. J Jamie Dimon, I don't know if anyone watched the um, CNBC interview with him early this morning on da in Davos, which he said, you know, like everyone's, all my banker friends are conflicted. We're saying to increase our capital ratios, and the administration is telling us to lend. You know, what is it? So everyone's conflicted, plus they have a bunch of crappy, their, port, their, invest, their portfolio is a bunch of crappy assets, which they have. A lot of, a lot of it hasn't even been written off. And there are, there are issues in the CDS market and the credit default swap market, so they don't know where they stand on their net exposure to sovereign debt. They don't know who's on the other side. We have you know, we had the absence of regulations, and now we're going to have, you know, what, what Bill Gross at PIMCO calls the new normal. And so you're going to have re-regulation um, because the pendulum shifts back. Like, try, remember I got that jumbo mortgage at Chase? Try to get a, seriously, try to, and you've got some money, try to get a half a million dollar or, a mil, let's say, a million dollar mortgage today. Even if you're a wealthy guy, you have a good net worth, you have very little debt, it's next to impossible. It's hard. Well, you have, you know, you have those sleazy guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Try running a hedge fund. It's every. It's there are certain hedge funds that you know that are monitored daily. Accounting judgments. There is the need for trans. The, 
the request for transparency is an outgrowth of all the irresponsible financial moves that were made in the lack of re regulation, the Bernie Madoff, the fraud, the hucksters, um, the implosion of hedge funds, which were not hedged, but basic leveraged pools, uh, capital pools, who did carry trades and then the underlying went kaput and they got, you know, they're out of business. So, you know, I like the fact that everyone's de-risked. I like the fact that the individual investor is taking $450 billion out of equity funds, mutual funds, since 2007 and put nearly $900 billion into low or no yielding fixed income products. Because there's only one way to go, and that's up. And you saw what happened in the last, in January. 33 out of 34 weeks leading up to January 1st had equity outflows. You began to see a trickle in, and when I say trickle in, under a billion dollars a week into mutual funds, equity mutual funds. And you saw what happened in the markets, up 5%. Can you imagine when people develop a risk appetite again, what will happen? And this will happen. Well, he's a trader. He's like everyone else. You know, it's like we buy. You know, we talk about stocks, and we end up buying at good prices, but we just chicken out, right? Because we don't have the confidence. You, it's it's hard, and, and that will ha the the people that will make the greatest amount of money are those people that bought Goldman at eighty nine and kept it, and you know they're going to wake up in a couple of years. It'll be two hundred and ten. And I'll have probably traded it for $3 back and forth 19 times. But the, these are the people that really accumulate wealth. It, you know, it happens. Pendulum swings back. Uh, what I like about, like I like asset managers as a class. You know, T. Rowe, publicly held asset managers, Franklin Resources, uh, Waddell Reed, Leg Mason, because they face five years of disintermediation of funds. So it can't get worse. One more. That's stick to my knitting, and my knitting is domestic equities. And so I think one of the important things in managing money is to recognize that when you don't know about something, you just admit it and just stick to what you know. So, so on that note, I would just, just, just note that to, to Steve Ross's question, you did kind of stick to your knitting on that one because he was actually asking what I would think of as a sociological question about how do we actually change mindsets about this larger social. It happens. This is the answer. It just happens. It's like my friend. Like I remember going on Pueblo like in March, know. in March two thousand nine, and I remember I said we are forming a generational low. The S and P was six sixty six, and he says where is where are the investors going to come from? Everyone I know is scared. I said you know where the investors come from when the stock market starts to rise, investors come in. It's as simple as that, Steve. But, but Doug, forgive me for this infomercial, as we look at this uh, camera right now. Oh, sorry. But <laughs> what we're doing right now is starting a social movement in this school that changes that mindset. That's our goal, because I actually don't believe. Up. I'm your straight man. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't believe that, that the pendulum just swings. I actually believe we have to educate people. I right think that way. would be a great professorial chair with Pass's name. Oh, I by, love it. By the way, <laughs> by the way, you're absolutely right. It's it's it happens over a long, right. long period of time. So we're in agreement then. It's not oh. just a pendulum swinging. We've got the edge. Oh. that's why you're here. So yeah, you know. I mean, it's like lending. <laughs> it's like lending. Everyone, you could borrow anything four years ago, and today, the lending departments are basically closed. So let me just say, I think I can speak for the entire audience, that this has been the most stimulating and exciting hour and a half, and we just thank you from the, the bottom of our hearts for this. <laughs>